This is the last lecture of the most boring set of chapters, chapters 23 and 26 in the American pageant. So we left off um, with an election in which Benjamin Harrison has won. <laughs> couple things you need to know about Benjamin Harrison and his presidency, like all the presidencies during the Gilded Age, or all the presidents during the Gilded Age, it's a very kind of hands-off approach. He does pass the Pension Act of 1890, which expands the number of people who are collecting a pension as a result of the Civil War. And this gives a huge boost to the Republican Party, because a Republican president, Benjamin Harrison, help support this bill, which means a lot of people are going to vote Republican uh, from the veterans of the Civil War. So there's one thing. And the other thing is tariffs go up. Remember one of the big battles Harrison was having with Grover was this issue of the tariff, and Grover had reduced the pension. So both those items are reversed. Boring stuff. 1892, interestingly enough, we have a rematch taking place. Um, and in this time, we have Grover Cleveland coming back as the Democratic candidate, hoping to win the presidency. Um, Democrats are going back to the well, as they say. And Benjamin Harrison is hoping that he's going to get a second term. Now, here's what happens. Things get complicated because there's another political party. Named the Populist Party. And James Weaver is running as a third party candidate in 1892. Now, if you look at the results, it doesn't look good for the Populist Party, but what you need to realize is he gets approximately 8.5% of the vote, and that equals a good amount, nearly a million voters vote for the Populist Party, and they get some support over in the West, Kansas, Colorado. Uh, the Democrats, Grover Cleveland, gets a lot of support. Of course, the South, solidly Democratic, but he also picks off some Northern states, and he gets reelected. Um, one of the reasons why Benjamin Harrison is not doing well in his uh, hopes for a second term is the tariff hurt Harrison, his support for that high tariff hurt people, and there were labor, there was labor strikes and violence taking place. So all of these things kind of factor in. Now Grover's back, the only guy ever uh, to actually serve as president, get defeated and come back for a second term non-consecutively, but things go really, really badly uh, in his second term. Be hard times. Hard times. And that all culminates in the Panic of 1893. There's a huge depression. Um, it's the first major modern industrial depression the nation is facing. It's, it's nationwide from 1893 to 1897, large-scale industrial depression. Um, something that happens during this depression is the Pullman strike. We'll cover that in another lecture, but basically workers at the Pullman company go on strike and it ends in violence, which hurts Grover Cleveland's reputation even further. Now, things are not going well and the American people are getting anxious. There's a resentment and there's demands that something get, gets done. Um, and Jacob Coxie is the guy who's going to lead a movement called Coxie's Army in 1894. And basically what Jacob Coxie and his army of men, put army in quotes, right, because it's not really his soldiers, they're not going to, you know, overthrow the government, but they start demanding things. Gun ho, gun ho, gun ho! What makes the grass grow? Blood, blood, blood! What they are calling for is help. And what particular they want is they want public works projects. They want, they are unemployed men, they want the government to hire them and to do public works projects, things like building roads, for instance. Um, and they start demanding that the government do something with regard to this economic collapse. And they march, and there's, you know, not a whole lot of them, about 500 men, march to Washington, D.C. They're demanding things from Congress, give work to the unemployed. You know, you're going to improve the highways. You're going to be able to, you know, help out the nation in its recovery. And um, the reason why Coxie's army is 
significant. Well, for one, how it all ends is not good for Coxie. He actually gets arrested uh, for, of all things, public trespassing. He was stepping on some grass that was uh, considered off limits. So you have Coxie getting arrested. What's important about Coxie's army? It's easily dealt with, right? There's no revolution. There's no, you know, anything significant that comes out of it. But what it shows is that there's a fear amongst middle class Americans. There's a fear that, oh, what is this mob of people doing? You know, is this the start of some sort of revolution, for, for instance? Um, and the government does nothing to help out the people. Coxie represents, that Coxie's army represents that, that demand for some sort of help. And the response of Grover Cleveland is, leave it alone. Laissez-faire. The government should do nothing. The government should do nothing and the economy will get back on track on its own. And if you're one of these unemployed people, this response from the federal government seems at this time, especially with a hard core depression, this seems just unacceptable. He does do something. Grover Cleveland does do one thing, and that is, She take my money when I'm in need. Yes, it's a trifling friend indeed. Repeals the, the Sherman Silver well, Purchase Act. That digs on me. And basically what that does is that takes out, reduces the amount of money in circulation. It was seen as kind of focusing more on hard money, especially gold. And by defending the gold standard, you would reduce speculation and that would somehow help out the economy. So his response actually was favorable to business, not everyday workers who were finding themselves in desperate situations. In fact, Grover Cleveland said, though the people support the government, the government should not support the people. And this is the perspective of many politicians of this time period. This laissez-faire, let it go kind of approach. Leave it alone. And as a result of his doing nothing, he starts losing support really quickly. For example, he's blamed for the panic. Calls out troops during the Pullman strike. <laughs> Repeals the Sherman Silver Purchase Act. And all of these things kind of cause even more resentment amongst voters. <laughs> and the Democratic Party is deeply divided. So, 1894, you have some midterm elections and the Populist Party actually gets a bump in support. Um, in fact, a lot of populist candidates win um, in Congress. You have victories taking place, especially in western states, but you have this 40% increase in the number of populist candidates that are elected. The Democrats are getting hit in the midterm elections for Congress. Republicans are getting some more votes. So you have this kind of backdrop to the election of 1894, 1896. Election of 1896 is one of those elections where the country is kind of at a crossroads. Where are they going to, what's the policy going to be? And the big issue in the 1890s was the issue of free silver. This became the big rallying cry for a lot of people. This would help alleviate the problems in some people's minds, economically speaking. And the guy who gets the nomination for the Democrats in 1896 for president, Grover's gone, is this guy. William Jennings Bryan. William Jennings Bryan, he's 36 years old, he's young, he's a Nebraskan lawyer, politician, and he gives at the nominating convention, um, She take my money when I'm in need. Yes, she's a trifling friend indeed. Oh, she's a gold digger. Way over time. The cross of gold speech. And the cross of gold speech is Bryant's 
famous speech, William Jennings Bryant's, and he basically says, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. And basically in his speech, he is calling for free silver. That becomes the big democratic position in 1896. And you've got this young, relatively unknown, dark horse candidate, William Jennings Bryan, who is calling for, in Chicago, in 1896, at the Democratic Convention, a platform for the free and unlimited coinage of silver. Exciting stuff. It's, it's riveting, I know. And in effect, the Democrat Party gets taken over by the civil rights. And you remember there was the gold bugs, there was the civil rights, and there was this, this commitment to this free silver approach. They're also talking about lowering tariffs, but the big thing is free silver. Now, for some, this was considered radical, right? This is this is what the populace wanted. This is what, you know, this was not the position of big business, especially banks and creditors. And you see William Jennings Bryan being portrayed with the donkey, the symbol of the Democrats, kind of this wild idea. And where is he going? Well, he's about to fly off a cliff. So people don't like this idea. When I say people, I mean business and banks don't like this because that would expand the money supply, making it cheaper and more readily available. So you have we a situation where the Republicans turn to this guy, William McKinley. And William McKinley runs on a platform of high tariff, endorsing the gold standard, so the opposite of what the Democrats are calling for. The election is portrayed as kind of the veteran of politics. William McKinley had been around for a while. He was a congressman from Ohio. He served in the Civil War. And as you can see, in 1861, William McKinley was upholding his country's honor. And he's doing it yet again. And of course, what are they doing with William Jennings Brown? Well, he is like a child. So you have these two men. And the campaign gets real dirty. It's run, actually, by Mark Hanna, is William McKinley's guy. And they run it on a platform of money and mud. And what that basically means is there's a huge amount of money that is spent by Republicans to discredit William Jennings Bryan. Um, In fact, it's famously called the Front Porch Campaign. Bryant was going around the country making speeches, giving speeches in like 29 different states, traveled over 15,000 miles giving these campaign speeches, talking to people about, you know, his position and free silver and things like this. And McKinley and Hannah, the Republicans, they just basically give out short statements from the campaign headquarters from the front porch. And the reason why you get the money in the mud is because people like J.P. Morgan, John D. Rockefeller give tons of money to the Republicans to defeat Bryan. Why? His tariffs are low and he wants free silver. Those are two things the businesses don't want to see happen. The election is dirty. Here they are actually crucifying. You can see Hannah right there kind of pinning the cross of gold kind of making fun of that. Election takes place, McKinley wins. Uh, Brian does pretty good for a you know newcomer, but he loses. Um, one reason why is because the Republican scare tactics, they you know portray Brian as too radical, gonna make the economy worse. And McKinley does two things and we're gonna close out this darn lecture. Tariff. And the Currency Act. Dingley Tariff, just know it pushes the tariff rates to an all-time high. Republican William McKinley, you're going to know tariffs for this particular period of time. And the Currency Act, 1897, officially puts the nation onto the gold standard. This closes out chapters 28, 3, and 26. One last big idea, though, that you need to know is what's really key is by the 1890s, American public opinion was starting to really question the laissez-faire Gilded Age policies. 
they want the federal government to do something with the social and the economic problems of the time period. In fact, that is the Interstate Commerce Act and the Sherman Antitrust Act. Those two laws are going to be established and both of those are going to attempt to restrict, to regulate businesses. And as I said in the previous lectures, these don't do much at the start, but they're precedents for the government getting involved to kind of stop this unlimited power of the monopolies and the trust and the railroad companies. The second part of chapter 26 is this. We're going to cover that at another time. Do your homework. Eat a vitamin.